This is FDR and the New Deal, Objective 1, Part 2, about uh, the policy goals of the first New Deal after Roosevelt got elected. Now, one of the key terms from this time period is the first hundred days of the first New Deal. This was about the three R's. These are the three big goals, relief, recovery, and reform. Now, the first New Deal policies were primarily short-term Band-Aid measures, and it's during this time that FDR and Congress pushed through an unprecedented level of new legislation at an unprecedented speed in the first hundred days. No president had ever pushed that, pushed that much legislation through in a hundred-day period, ever. And Congress was more than willing to oblige. FDR had simply been given a blank check from Congress, but the problem was he had no real plan to go along with it. Uh, FDR was basically just reacting to things. It was primarily because the public wanted any action, even if it was the wrong action. It didn't really matter. They just wanted somebody to try to do something, anything. And so uh, FDR never really proceeded ahead with a, a significant plan of any sort as much as he did just react to what was going on. The first step was the Bank Relief Act of 1933, also known as the quote-unquote bank holiday of March 6th through 10th. This was a law that was passed in eight hours, which was a ridiculous amount of speed. Basically what it did was it closed all banks for five days. What Roosevelt was trying to do was reestablish confidence in the banks. Remember, banks had been the ones that had loaned out all the money that people had put in them at, in the 1920s. Well, Roosevelt was basically saying that we're going to close all the banks for five days and evaluate them. The bad ones, the ones who had given out the riskiest loans, the wildcat-style banks, would stay closed. They would be punished for what they had done. The ones that hadn't done that would be reopened at the end of the quote-unquote bank holiday. What this did was restore public confidence in the banks. And it had worked. Americans were willing to deposit in banks again after this. Not every American, of course. But most Americans were willing to take another shot at it with the confidence that loans would not be given out in a reckless way. Immediately after that, Roosevelt delivers the first of what he would most likely become most famous for, the fireside chats on the radio explaining to the country that everything was going to, go, everything was going to be okay, just put your money back in the banks again. But how can you ensure that banks aren't going to loan out your money recklessly, or if they do, that you'll ever get it back? Well, that was the next step in the first hundred days uh, of Franklin Roosevelt's uh, uh, New Deal program. Uh, it was called the Glass-Steagall Act, and it created the FDIC. Today we know it as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. We still have it on bank placards all over the country right now, and basically what it means is that if a bank does lose your money, and you go to get it back, if they've loaned it out recklessly or it's been lost in some other fashion, banks will now reimburse your funds up to, I believe these days, $275,000. Roosevelt also instituted the Federal Securities Act, uh, which required full information on stocks and bonds so that uh, you knew if you were getting involved in something risky. And he instituted the Securities and Exchange Commission in 1934, also known as the SEC. This was pr uh, created to prevent speculation and loaning. They didn't give out, you know, anybody that was caught giving out risky loans could be punished by the SEC. And it also stopped the illegal practices on the stock market of getting insider trading tips and things like that that could drive up prices and lead a lot of people to want to buy a bunch of stock all at once. Those had been some of the causes of the Great Depression, after all. Finally, what Roosevelt ordered was to have all private gold be sold to the Treasury at high prices in exchange for currency. He basically said to people, take your money to the Treasury, sell it to the Treasury so that we'll have more gold in the primary wealth supply, and we'll give you a lot of currency back. That way we can create some inflation and pay off some debts. Now, inflation isn't usually a policy you want to have, but if you are putting more money in people's pockets, let's say I give you $20 and the debt you had taken out was $10 at the time, well, the debt isn't going to increase just because the inflation does. You have 20, 20 bills in your pocket now and can pay off a $10 debt. And without debt, people would start spending again with the extra money that they have. It's one of those rare occurrences where creating inflation might have been a good thing. 
The New Deal also attempted to try to solve the unemployment problem, which again was 25%, the highest in the history of the United States. The first program that Roosevelt used to try to solve this was called the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC. This employed 3 million men to restore forests and fight fires. 47 members of the CCC died, by the way, fighting forest fires. To control floods and drain swamps. And basically just plant new trees and restore the landscape to some degree. Now, this wasn't something that a lot of these guys were used to doing. Remember, they'd been ba former bankers and lawyers and things like that. But they were now collecting a paycheck. And they were required, as part of being part of the CCC, they were required to send home most of their pay to help families. If you travel down to Misik right now or that general area, you're going to see a lot of well-grown-up pine trees that are in perfect rows. Anytime you see a forest in perfect rows like that, most likely those were trees planted in the 1930s by the CCC. Another program was the Federal Emergency Relief Act, and administration, I should say, uh, known as uh, FERA, F-E-R-A, which granted $3 billion to states for direct relief payments or wages on various works projects. The next one was the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the AAA, not the CAR AAA, but the AAA for farmers. It basically gave farmers millions in mortgage relief, gave them millions to help them with the mortgages they were having trouble paying off as farm prices had gone down. There was also the uh, Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was support for one million non-farm mortgages. It turned political loyalties of many to middle class, from middle class to Democrat because the Democrats were the ones supplying people with mortgage relief in their basic everyday homes. And it also brought about the CWA, the Civil Works Administration, which provided for temporary jobs in the wintertime. But one of the most famous parts of the first New Deal programs was the TVA, also known as the Tennessee Valley Authority. The electric power industry had grown dramatically in the 1920s, and the TVA was put to work building hydroelectric dams in the valley of the Tennessee River and its tributaries. Now this provided a lot of work. On this slide you see the Tennessee Valley right here, and it basically was the size of, of England, uh, just that general area. So there were plenty of rivers and tributaries to build dams in, and a lot of people were put to work doing that. And it wasn't just that you were giving someone a paycheck building these dams, is that it w it's that it was providing electricity for a fairly large area around it. Another uh, New Deal program was the Federal Housing Administration, also known as the FHA. These were small loans to make improvements to existing homes or to build completely new ones, and that boosted the economy for the construction industry and all the resources associated with it, like lumber, and uh, glass, steel, things like that. And as if things couldn't get any better, the 21st Amendment, this is something that I want you to put on your timeline, the 21st Amendment was passed in 1933 as well, which made alcohol legal again. You can see in the slide here, especially with you know this glass right here, people were pretty happy to have their beer back and all the rest of their booze as well. Then they put people to work making it and taxing it for govern government revenue. So that was a part of Franklin Roosevelt's First New Deal programs. But not everybody thought the First New Deal was a great thing. Uh, even though somebody was trying, many New, new Deal programs didn't do enough, uh, despite all of the taxing and all of the spending. And this led to a lot of fear and opposition. Many people feared that was what was happening in Germany at that time when Hitler was rising up in power in the 1930s. A lot of people feared that what Franklin Roosevelt was doing uh, was going to create a similar situation in the United States with Roosevelt as the dictator. A lot of people were taxing and spending, and the idea was that uh, you know Adolf Hitler had risen to power at a time when people were starving. He made promises to them, and they followed him blindly. Like I said, a lot of people feared that that would happen in the United States if Franklin Roosevelt was allowed to run amok. Fear of the New Deal gave rise to many demagogues, in other words, people who were almost godlike in stature that everybody was willing to follow in opposition to the New Deal. The first one was Father Charles Coughlin, a, pre a priest out of Detroit, who had started broadcasting in 1930 and reached an audience of 40 million. 
he called for social justice and was very much anti-New Deal. But Father Coughlin was also very anti-Semitic, in other words, very anti-Jewish, and very pro-fascist, in other words, somewhat pro-Adolf Hitler. Uh, those leanings, he didn't go all the way there, but those leanings really hurt him uh, and his popularity with a lot of people. Another one was Dr. Francis Townsend, who was uh, an advocate for the elderly and promised everyone over 60 years old a $200 a month payment. It's basically impossible to deliver on that, but if they weren't willing to follow the New Deal, he was convincing people that they could follow him. But the most dangerous of all might have been Senator Huey Long, also known as the Kingfish, uh, uh, out of Louisiana. He'd actually been governor of Louisiana at one time, too, and had now been elected to senator of the state. Huey used to get on the radio and promote the quote-unquote Share Our Wealth program. It was basically a Robin Hood approach that was about taking from the rich and instead of spending it on programs, which is what the New Deal was doing with the tax money it was taking from the rich, giving every family $5,000. Now, this all sound good, uh, but many feared Huey Long and, and the idea, because he'd been known in Louisiana for kind of muscling people around to get what he wanted. And therefore, people feared that he would want absolute power, again, which he was already showing in Louisiana as a fascist dictator. Again, people were fearing that what was happening in Germany could happen in the United States, not just with FDR, but with Huey Long as well. Huey Long actually had a private police force. He also said that he was willing to help out starving people by giving them money. And in exchange, he wanted absolute power. Does that sound like anybody that you know? As a result, Huey Long, who had been privately described as the most dangerous man in America, was assassinated in 1935, another date that I want you to add to your timeline. Okay, that is the end of FDR and the New Deal Objective 1, Part 2. Thank you for listening.